I'm Mike Fine, also known as Bohemian with BootsByBohemian.com. Welcome to Shop Night, where I make a gift for a deserving person and in our community in one or two evenings using scrap from around my shop. I enjoy and love history and the many historical events and reenactments that groups sponsor. The people, the atmosphere, and the activities are just amazing. It's May of 2020, and I imagine myself on a great contact high from just coming back from Ravensborg. It's a Viking hill fort, and the people there are amazing and fun. I also imagine the anticipation of getting ready for Grand Outlandish, and as the name says, it's an outlandish week with lifelong friends. But as you know, folks, this season's been canceled. I also miss hanging out in my shop with my friends busting shops while making gear for these events. So let this be our hammer and hammer, you and me. Let's hang out. Let's make some historically based coolness. And you can bust my chops in the comment section. Please be aware that this is not a how-to and I will cover patterns in the future. Tonight I begin by making a pair of fighting boots for the SCA with 14th century styling. Duchess Adriel, for all you do, this shop night's for you. Find out why Adriel is so awesome in the description. Now this project's gonna take eight hours to complete, and so it will be broken up into two evenings and two episodes, and this is part one. Let's get started. So the 14th century fighting boot is, uses four major pattern pieces. It uses the midsole, the vamp, which covers the toes, and the boot, which comes up the leg, um, all based on Adriel's tracings and measurements, and it's gonna use a generic heel piece that I often use that's gonna be perfect for this project. I'll discuss these two pieces in a little bit. This is a six to seven ounce oil tan cowhide. It's my preferred leather. You can use either chrome or oil tanned. Just make sure you can see your fingertips when you bring it on the leather. I transfer all my patterns to the suede or backside of the leather. So the first step is to mark all the flaws in the leather. And one of the things I want to make sure is we don't use the pits. What I have here is the spine and the belly. This is the neck. So this is the front foreleg. And now I'm going to mark all the flaws I see that I don't want in my boot. Over here we have what was the, the spine of the animal and this is the belly of the animal. This is going to be important on how we lay out. And now you can see I've made all my marks and I'm going to start laying out my pattern. So here we have the vamp or the toe part of the boot and this is really critical for orientation. Here we have the spine and here we have the belly. It's important that both of them get cut out right next to each other so the grain of the cow matches. And cows stretch a lot more from belly to back than they do from head to tail. So we don't want our boot or shoe to overstretch. So I always line this up, the side to side, with the least amount of stretch. And I do the heel to toe with the most amount of stretch. When you cut or release the tension from an organic animal that's been run through a roller, when you, when you start cutting it, you can notice that the leather starts moving and shifting and curling. So what we're gonna do is try to eliminate, um, that's gonna happen anyway, but we're gonna eliminate having bad lines because of it by not releasing the tension in the leather until after these lines are cut. So you might be asking yourself right now, you know, what's with all the scrap? Well, I'm gonna generate a lot of scrap in this project because hides being organic are not uh, consistent from one part of the hide to the other. When I'm making a pair of custom boots, the biggest input is labor. So if I waste three feet of leather making this boot, um, I've wasted $12, maybe 16. And so 
with that leather having a second purpose in my shop of making bags and pouches and some of the stuff like the armpits work really great for certain parts of certain bags. So I'm not wasting the leather, I'm just going to put it to its proper use. So you'll notice here that I'm cutting a straight line with my rotary cutter and I am spitting the leather underneath. Again, this can be done with a pair of scissors. I'm just not using scissors. So one of the things about cutting curved lines with scissors is people have a tendency to try to rotate the scissor like this uh, in relation to the leather. You wanna keep the scissor absolutely perpendicular at a 90 degree angle with your project at all times. Now I could try to turn my hand or I could turn both hands, turn the scissor and work around my hand what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut a straight line in my mind and I'm gonna turn the leather around it. I'm gonna get a cleaner cut that way. So you can use a rotary cutter like I've been using or a pair of sharp leather shears. One of the things to note that when you're coming to a hard angle like this, is to remove the line obviously because the paper pattern was correct but cut past your hard angle and then come in with a new cut don't try to turn the scissor all right so we're a couple of minutes into the project and i have all the parts cut out um, i think you'll notice that this is what i intended with these small pieces is for them to match up here perfectly and to leave this margin at the bottom for us to sew to the midsole like that so it's all flat and easy. You can see that my vamps look pretty good together. Um, again, this is made from scrap, so that's how it goes, but it's still looking pretty good. And um, if we look at the back side, we'll see that very little black line is left. If the paper pattern is correct, you don't want to have a whole lot of black lines left. Uh, a hair uh, width of, of black lines fine. We're all good. So now we're on to the next step, which is sniffing glue. We have two jobs to do. First of all, we're going to glue these before we sew them. And then we're going to line this boot. And so for the liner, we're going to go ahead and use a glue. And this is a deer tan, or a deer uh, that is deer tanned in the traditional way. Uh, we're going to use that for our liner. My preferred glue is Regina Cologne, which is very similar to Barge's cement. It's designed for the footwear industry, and I use it as prescribed. I also use Echo Bond, an environmentally marketed PVA glue. No glue applied comes in direct contact with a person wearing it by design in my footwear. Much of the chemicals will have evaporated before ever leaving the shop. That said, wear a mask, avoid skin contact while the glue is wet. Contact cement works like this. Both surfaces are treated with the wet glue, the glue dries to a tacky state, and the two pieces are applied together using pressure, usually a BFH or a hammer is preferred. So what I've done is I've applied contact cement or my Regina cologne to each of these pieces. What's important is, is I have focused on the outer edge most because if the outer edge fails, the whole piece fails. Now because this is a heel piece and because it's oil tanned and because the glue instructions written on the can say so, it is going to be doubled or tripled glue. So we're gonna let this dry, then we're going to glue it again, and then we're going to glue it again we're going to let it dry like it's supposed to uh, at the right uh, amount of tackiness, which I'll show you. And then we're going to bond with a hammer. So I made an arrow earlier. It lines up with the longer buckle strap. So I'm going to start in the center, match my two points, match my line coming all the way down while keeping the rest of the piece elevated. Now it's ready for the hammer. The hammer I'm going to be using is a uh, hammer specific to shoemaking. It's called a French hammer. I like it because it doesn't mar the leather when I do this. Go. All right, so it might seem counterproductive, but I do need to test, test my bond. So here we go. And I've gotten a good affection. So this is my deer and it's going to be full of flaws. What I want to do is make sure that the flaws 
art in the top half of each upper boot. So if I lay this one right there, and I lay this one right here. By the way, orientation on this particular part does not matter. And um, yes, there's a lot of scrap going to be generated, but they're all going to fit baglets for the pouches I make. So all this leather will get used, but we're using this for the pair of boots. So here's my deer lining. And we are now going to glue suede side to suede side, and then we're going to trim at the end. All right, so my glue is ready and I'm gonna start moving really fast. Two ways to go about putting the two pieces together. One is if you're all alone, you will wrap this one, roll it in wax paper, and administer it to this one, which would be laid on the work surface. I have a friend today, and I'm gonna use that friend to my advantage hold the two ends. So I'm gonna give my friend instructions and walk them through what to do for me. Okay, I want you to lower this down to the project. Okay, so I'm gonna take the corner here. All right, just hold it. Perfect. You know, I want you to put your finger on the other end. There you go, just like that. I've got a little bobble here. I'm not gonna pull too tight because I don't want the leather to curl. This is one way to force leather into compound shapes. If that's what you intended to do, I don't. I want it to be fairly flat. And there we go, I've got a great bond. So once again, using my French hammer, and I'm gonna get the edges as good as I can. Test for bond. I got a really tight bond on that. That's great. Now we're going to trim. To dye or not to dye, that is the question. This is an oil tan leather, and I always want to test how it's going to take an edge dye before I put it on a finished piece. Okay. So here we are 20 minutes later. I have used Phoebings, one's an oil, and one's an alcohol-based dye. As you can see, both of them have bled into my project. Had I done this on my finished pieces, I'd be really sad right now. So here are the three awls I'm going to be using for this project. They're in fact the same awl, and this is the store bark version of the, uh, of the awl, and it's not been modified. And it's to reintroduce holes that might not be big enough for the needle, uh, or we might have missed during punching. This is a awl that I have modified. I put a slight hook into it, and I have uh, filed it and sanded it down to a finer point. And I use this for scratching marks. Um, so I call this my scratch awl. And this last awl, I use for marking holes. I don't want to penetrate the leather and I don't want to um, make a hole with it. What I want to do is mark using my patterns where my punches are going to go so it has been blunted and it has been shortened so it fits really good in my hand so I can move really fast when I'm marking my holes. You've watched me transfer the holes on these paper patterns to the leather, and these punches explain the distance in the holes. These are both four hole punches. This tine uh, width is for two layers of leather, and this tine width is for one layer of leather. And what we do is that my holes, when I've made my pattern, is I've used my four hole punch like a compass. So when as I stretch out my pattern, I've made it so I can just punch, and I can just punch, and I can just punch, and just punch and my holes all line up with my pattern.
so when doing a piece, I can always stretch this leather or, or make it bend. But if I bring, start punching from the end and I come inside here, what I find is if I run out of room, because again, leather will shrink and twist and pull once it's released from tension from going through the rollers, what I might have is a piece that doesn't match my pattern exactly. Not because I cut it out wrong or traced it wrong, but because the leather released its tension from the rolling process. So I always like to start from the center and work my way around because I can always stretch and pull from the outside. Okay. So for my heel piece, we have uh, two layers of leather and I'm going to use the, the wider tined punch, four hole punch now, to punch the holes. And once again, I will start in the center of the piece. So this is my ch uh, super cheap candy skyver. Uh, I bought it at $2.95. It might be different now. Um, when skiving a project, you always use a new blade, specifically when you're making a pair of custom handmade boots. And you can see the blade goes on this curved piece. How the skyver works is like this. It's curved, the blade is curved. One side of the blade, whether it be the inside or the inside, outside, needs to run across this smooth surface. Now this is a sink cutout from a granite company that I got on Craigslist for a few bucks. And I wanna show you how the skyver works. So when going um, this direction, I'm gonna have the part by my thumb run on the granite and remove the leather so that we have a one millimeter edge paper thin on this side, but where my stitches will be, it's still the full six ounce leather. So now I'm gonna skive using this edge because I always wanna to pull towards myself. I have more control over the material that way. So now I'm gonna run it around the smooth surface. And again, just take like a, a triangle cut so that the this edge is now one millimeter and or less, and this edge here is this full six ounce leather. Here's my vamp, and now I'm gonna sky for reals. I can't sky the full distance, which is why I will rotate the piece and use the other edge of the skyver. So this is where my buckle is going to go. This is one of the short straps. It's going to bend over and then it's going to be sewn through through here. So when I look at it, I know I don't need this much material based on the buckles that I chose. And now I'm going to feather that out as well. This time I'm going to have to use the center of the skyver and not use an edge of the work surface. And that's a skill set. to make that paper thin so that when it's over here, once again, the stitches are going to be through the full six ounce leather, but where it fades into the boot here, you're not gonna feel it, or the wear is not gonna feel it because we have skived it thin. So my quatrefoil punch is a punch that I bought on Etsy and it's it's not the best. It's pretty dull. You can tell I've tried to polish and sharpen it and I'm not getting great results. So instead of punching from the front side, I'm going to, since the boot's going to get folded over like this, I'm going to punch this side because this is the side that's seen. And this is how to look when the boot is worn. So for the next step, I could run my, my tool up here and hand stitch this, and I would hand stitch it face to face, like this. But um, I have a sewing machine, folks, 
So I'm going to go ahead and use my leather sewing machine. The best stitch for this is a saddle stitch. I'm going to go ahead and use a locking stitch sewing machine. So it's difficult to see, but the last hole I punched is here and here. I'm going to line those up. I'm going to drop my needle right through that. Now I can feel by the friction of the needle that I got it. And now I'm going to sew. And then lock. So here's something I learned from an old cowboy boot guy. I'm going to take my needle up to the edge, lock it, pick up the foot, spin it around, double sew. So you can see that this is a lot of material. What we have here is about a quarter of an inch. I'm going to trim it down so that I can flatten this, again using a cowboy boot technique. So I'm going to use my rotary cutter and trim off the access. I recommend this wax thread from Tandy. It comes in a 132 yard roll for eight bucks. Um, but I love Adriel a lot. Um, that's the unpackaged Tandy uh, wax thread. And this is sinew. So this is a natural sinew spun up in a roll. I think it's gonna look great with the gold buckles and with this really nice oil tanned leather. So I'm gonna make it hard on myself and use the sinew. For the needle, I'm going to use this uh, blunted uh, sewing needle. It's uh, one of the larger ones that Tandy uh, sells. You use whichever works best for your hand and the punch you have. So this is what I'll be using. The picture here is going to represent one layer, and this is going to be the second layer, stacked. Here's my picture. And we're going to call this uh, Bohemian's Go-To Stitch. If you want to look up a saddle stitch online and use that, saddle stitch will work great. This is the top layer, this is the bottom layer, and here we go. We're going to come up through the bottom. We are going to skip a hole. We are going to come down. We're going to come back. We're going to come up. We're going to come over, skip this hole. It's being used. Go down. Come up. And one of the important things to know is the which way you push this little loop you make will affect the pattern of the boots stitching. And I'll show you that when we actually get a needle and thread. All right, so here I am at my first hole. I'm gonna go up, leave two needle lengths of material behind or thread behind. I'm going to skip this hole. I'm gonna go down this hole. And I have to push my loop the same way every time. So I'm gonna pull it towards myself. I'm gonna come up through the unused hole. Tighten it up. Now this is the hole I'll be skipping. It's being used. I'll go down this hole. Being a little bit fussy about lining up. Again, I'll push the loop towards myself. come up with my you can get my tension holes in there somewhere there we go again I'm gonna pull the loop towards myself the wrong one it's hard to do facing the camera yeah. So we finished up sewing up the side. Now I'm going to turn the shoe inside out. And to close this stitch, we are going to go underneath. And this is where you're going to learn a little something about, about me, is I hate, loathe, and will not put knots in footwear. 
So I will put this stitch and because of the uh, friction, this boot will never become uh, unsewn and any pressure upon this seam will have some relief because we're gonna sew the upper, which is a single piece up here. Get that close. I'm gonna skip a hole, go down a hole. And you're gonna notice that now I'm gonna keep pinching the boot like this. And I'm gonna just move my hand as I go and I'm gonna to sew towards my open hand or non-sewing hand. So I'm right-handed, so the needle will be in my right hand and my left hand will pretty much be clamping the boot as I sew around. Here we are at the end of the first night and we'll pick it up here right after intermission.